So, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how we can do. I did have a question about slugs again, and I'll, I'll just tell you what I told them. Um, I've been studying slugs for probably three years because I think they're the bane of no-till, okay? You, you're not going to kill them with an insecticide. They absorb the insecticide. They got that uh, slime around them. And then whatever eats them gets a 10, 20 times dose, okay? So the insecticides do nothing. They're a mollusk, okay? But they do have what I would call an, an Achilles heel, okay? They cannot, they do not like salt. So if you're using salt type of herbicides, that will help. But even more so, they do not tolerate sulfur. Now, we used to get all kinds of sulfur with acid rain. When's the last time you guys heard the term acid rain, okay? All right, nobody's talked about acid rain, but we were getting 30 pounds of sulfur for free every year. We need 20. Now we're getting 8 to 10. What's happened to our sulfur levels in the soil? Going down. And uh, slugs cannot tolerate sulfur. They cannot digest it. Best way I can put this is they can't fart. Okay, they just, they blow up. They, they get gas, and they just can't get rid of it. And the way you can tell it is, you look at a slug, and tongue-in-cheek, they get a little sluggish, okay? You look at them, and right behind their mantle is their lung. So you look at the front, they got the antenna. You'll see this little bubble forming, and what happens is that sulfur dioxide, they'll look like they're almost pregnant, or they'll, they'll start to turn black. We know that if you put enough radishes, we did a little bit of research on that, but you probably gotta go the higher rate on the radish, at least probably two pounds the acre. Radish has a lot of sulfur in that. If they eat that radish, we have seen them eat it, they'll take a couple bites, and then they get a belly ache and they die, okay? That's one thing you can try, but you probably need it for a little bit at the higher rate. Make sure you put some cereal rye with it because we don't want the phosphorus and we don't want the soil erosion. The other thing you can do is try some calcium sulfate. Put a couple hundred pounds of calcium sulfate, which is gypsum. Put that on before you plant. Okay, there's an added benefit to this. Okay, now I was an extension and we did research on gypsum for years. One ton, two ton, five ton, ten ton to the acre. What kind of yield increase would we get? About two bushel on soybeans. It wasn't enough to pay for. It. But you're getting a couple elements. You're getting calcium and sulfur. Let me ask you this. If I were to put on nitrate with nothing else on in the fall, how much of that nitrate would be available next spring? None. Okay, what happens with calcium? Calcium is a regular large atom, okay, but it's small enough that it wants to be tied up, and it gets tied up in your soil structure. If I put it on in the fall, it's probably not going to be available in the spring, okay? So what do you want to do? You put that on in the spring, either before planting, or if, you're, if you don't have the slug issues, put it on right after you plant. 80% of the calcium that a plant needs is that pollination. Calcium is so critical, it activates 146 enzymes. Okay? And if you get that calcium on, put it on. Let the, Hopefully, we, it's not a dry year. If it's a dry year, it's going to take longer. It takes... 30 to 45 days generally for it to break down, okay? And then it should be plant available, but if it gets on leaves, if you've got cover crops out there or something like that, and you put this dust on there and those slugs eat that, it's kind of sweet. I mean, calcium makes all things a little bit sweeter. Hopefully they eat a whole bunch of it and they just blow up. Okay, and that will keep your slug, hopefully keep your slug pocket. I'm not promising you that that's going to always work, but that's something that you might try at least and see, see how it's going. But they cannot tolerate salt. We know that. They can't tolerate salt. Okay, now we're going to switch now and go to, yep, we're up there. We're going to talk a little bit about soil compaction and soil structure. Okay, if you guys have other questions, 
Hopefully we'll get those during the question and answer. I don't mind being interrupted. It's just that we've got to be done here by a uh, uh, quarter till. So hopefully we can get through all this. This is what an ideal sh soil should look like. Just some general things here. We've got this pore space. Ideally, we want about 50% pore space in our soils. Right now, our soils do not have near 50%. We've got to have that pore space. Why? Because that air, that oxygen, is so important for that plant. Okay? That's the oxygen that goes in so that we can get the carbon dioxide to come out so that we can get better yields. Okay? So that's part of what's going on here is if we condense this down, about 45% is going to be the inorganic. That's your, your rock that's broken down and rock breaks down into what? First breaks down into sand. Sand breaks down into silt. Silt breaks down into clay, okay? And that clay has a tremendous cation exchange capacity, okay? Let's say it has a, a cation exchange of, say, uh, 30. Then we have this 5%, ideally, that is organic matter. What's the cation exchange? When I talk about cation exchange, I'm talking about positive charges, places that we can attach elements, okay? So that's what we're trying to do, is we want more room. So clay is very good. What about this organic matter? It has a cation exchange capacity of 300. Okay, so what happens is we've got this clay particle, this brick, and this organic matter, and we get all these elements caught in between. Okay? All right, that's what we're trying to do. Now, I've already talked about this. Human, H-U-M-I-N, that's the one that has anion exchange capacity. That means it has a positive charge, and it'll attract a lot of negative things like nitrate and your phosphate. Okay? So you want to have all these. You want the fulvic, F-U-L-B-I-C, about a pint per acre. You want the human, that's for your fertilizer, your nitrate, and your phosphate. And then you want the humic acid, that's the black stuff, okay? And that's the real dense stuff, okay? And all those are really good for your soil, okay? So that's kind of what we're looking at. We want to keep this about 50% and this 50%. That way the roots can grow down, and now they'll have access to all those nutrients that are out there. If we get this too compacted, what happens? We get rid of the air. And, and we, it goes anaerobic, that means a lack of oxygen, and then all of a sudden your roots aren't going to grow, it's going to be really wet, and now we're not going to have access to all those nutrients that we need, okay? That's why compaction is one of those hidden things. I know uh, Randall Reeder's done a lot of research on this. He says your compaction problems will last 9 to 10 years. He's way off. It's 50, 60, it could be 100 years. I can go back and I can find in almost any soil that's been conventionally tilled, I can find the plow layer from 50, 60 years ago, even though they haven't plowed. Okay? Uh, we can find those levels. Vertical tillage. What's happening on the vertical tillage? Now, instead of going down so deep, we're getting levels at 4 inches and 2 inches. Guys are going, they're vertical tilling. Anytime you take a tillage tool, you go across that soil and you're smearing that surface, you're keeping it so the water can't go down. We can get a half inch rain, guys. How many of you have seen this? Half inch rain and we got standing water out there. Have you seen that? It's because of compaction, poor soil structure. I'm just telling you, the way you break that up, you get the roots in there, you get a macropore, you start getting some micropores, so you spread that water out in the soil, you get the biopores, and then when that water goes through, and if you've got a live root there, all that water is it's going to suck up all those uh, soluble nutrients and clean it so that when the water comes out, it's going to be clear coming out of your tile. And we have, I have pictures of this. That, it's in other PowerPoints. We don't have time for that today, okay? But that's what we're doing. We're going to talk a little bit about bulk density, okay? And I know these are scientific terms. These are, but don't worry about it. We'll, we will very easily... Uh, I'll make this obvious, okay? Which of these would you prefer that I throw at you? <laughs> Is this while I'm at work or after work? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. I might get a different answer after you've had a drink. <laughs> so, you obviously want this Please, one, right? This one is yeah. last kept. Look, almost the same volume, so 
we're looking at volume centimeters cubed divided by the weight. This one weighs a lot more, same volume, so it's a lot more dense. Now, I've got this brick. What's this brick made of? Clay. Clay. Okay. And how did I make this brick? Okay, I took clay out of the subsoil, put it in a furnace, and I let it uh, get really hard. Okay, I mean, it, what happened is it got hard because I burned up all the organic matter and I let it dry and it gets real hard, okay? What do we call a brick on top of the soil? Call it a clod. Clods are man-made, okay? Now, if I look at this organic matter, that's what this sponge is, if I put some organic matter in between two clay particles, notice what I can do. I can not only hold a lot of nutrients in there because it's got a high cation exchange and if you've got some human in there it's also got some anion exchange so that I can hold some of those negative charge so both positive and negative charge but I can squeeze it and it'll come right back that's what we're doing with these macro aggregates macro aggregates if I take a, uh, some grass you guys can go home and you can do this dig up a little chunk of grass we should have just done that should have got the shovel off somebody's got a shovel I got one in the back of my truck, I'll give you my keys if somebody wants to go out and get some, but you, you, you dangle it, and what do you see? You see little pegs. Those are those macro aggregates. Those are the glues and the sugars combining with the organic matter and the sand, silt, and clay, and that's what gives you good soil structure. It should look like black cottage cheese, okay? So it will crumble. When the soil Get, and you till it, what happens to the organic matter? It goes up into the atmosphere, and then what happens? Now i got two bricks. I'm going to use your fist here for a minute. And now I put in a, these has a, what kind of charge do I have on clay? Negative charge. If I put a positive ion like calcium, or uh, 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 potassium, or any other positive ion, this is going to set up like a brick wall, okay? So think about this. Every time you till the soil, it gets real smooth, okay? Have you ever seen a farmer just go out there and just till the heck out of his soil? It gets a real, real smooth. What happens when it rains? It all runs off, doesn't it? We get all that soil erosion. So what we want to do is we want to form macro aggregates, take this organic matter, Form these macro aggregates. Now we're going to have pores in our soil. And by doing that, we'll get the water to infiltrate. And, and guess what? 80% of your carbon is tied up with your macro aggregates. Okay? And it also will greatly increase your water holding capacity. I've got some slides on that. And we'll show you that here in a little bit. Okay? So that's what we're doing. So what are we doing with bulk density? The higher the number, the worse it is. You want it to be about 50%. So what we would like to see is, we'd like to see an uncultivated, undisturbed woodlot. Ideally, the, the, the cutoff number is 1.3. So if we got about 1.3, that means 50% of it's hard and dense. The other 50% can hold water and air. Okay, so anything less than 1.3, it has a lot more pore space. So this has a lot of pore space. What's happening here? We start getting cultivated clay silt loams, cultivated sandy loams, compacted. Once this number gets up really, really high, the highest you'll get is 2.65. Okay? At 2.65, it's completely dense. There's no air, uh, room for air and water. Okay? So ideally, we'd like to keep this at around at least below 1.4. Okay? That's, that's the goal. Uh, 1.6, 1.4 is kind of in that medium. On a clay, actually, if we can keep it down about 1.1. Most of our soils aren't near that, okay? This is for ideal bulk density for plant growth. Once it gets greater than these numbers, what happens? The roots go off, and they go off at a right-hand angle, and they cannot penetrate, okay? So that's part of the problem that we have. Let's take a look. This is bulk density. We're down there about seven inches, six, seven inches. This is the old plow pan. What's the bulk density? 1.9. Roots go down, they go off at a right angle. Can they get below that compacted layer? Yes, if they find a crack. 
So now we find a big crack, those cracks shrink and swell. What happens when it rains? Water flows across the surface, it finds one of these big cracks and it goes straight down to your tile, takes all those nutrients on the soil surface, goes right down to your tile and goes right out into Lake Erie. Okay, out through the river to Lake Erie. What we're doing is we're using the roots to break up this compacted layer, getting it to spread out so that when we finally get down to our tile, that water's going to be clean again. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. This is an important number, right? This one blows my mind. 1% soil organic matter takes up 5% of the soil volume. Okay? Imagine if you had 6% organic matter. That'd be 30% of the soil volume. I noticed this a couple years ago. I didn't know that's what the, the ratio was. I was driving home. I was going to school down at Ohio State. And I noticed these fence rows. What do you see when you see a fence row? I, I know a lot of fence rows are gone, but there's still one there. There was an elevation difference. Okay? The elevation was about 6 to 9 inches. I went out and measured it. And I took this back to the professor. I, I love playing with professors. <laughs> oh, my God. And I could tell he didn't know what he was talking about, and I pressed him and pressed him. He finally said, well, Jim, why don't you investigate? He says, I think it's just wind erosion. I said, no, it can't be. I went out, took a whole bunch of measurements in the lee side of a woods, six to nine inches. Six to nine inches of elevation. If 50% of that is pore space, how much additional water can you hold? Anywhere from three to four inches more water in a soil that has not been compacted. Okay, so that's what we're finding. Where we have organic matter, the soil is less dense. Every pound of soil organic matter can hold 18 to 20 pounds of water. Okay, so it acts like a sponge. It's just like that sponge there. This is what it looks like under the microscope. This is the organic matter. When you look under an electric microscope, you'll see all this pore space there. That's those black areas. If you look at clay, what is it? It's in layers. Okay, very much layers. This is silica. And a lot of these are silica and probably some aluminum in there. That's what our clay is made out of. And they're very much layered. But there's no room for air and water around there. Not a lot of room anyways. There might be some. But this organic matter is what gives our soil structure. Okay? That's what we're looking at. Compacted soils. Densities uh, anywhere from 1.6 to 1.8 or higher compared to maybe our regular soil at a 1.45. Compacted soil has higher density than regular soil, less space for air and water. They act, and here's what happens. When it really rains hard, have you ever washed our ditches? What happens to the ditch? Woo. Go up, and they go down really quick. Okay, So it's causing flood. These are actually like mini flash floods on our soil because our soil is becoming a lot like concrete. Okay? Concrete will actually absorb water and lose it, but it does it very, very slowly, and that's what's happening to our soil. Dense soils have less microbial life, less biological life. Three factors that will compact your soil. Number one, yes, is that heavy equipment, but rain and gravity will also compact it. And I will also say that tillage is a major factor. Why is tillage a major factor? Because tillage is how we burn up the organic matter in the soil. I should probably add that one. I don't know why I haven't thought about that earlier. It just came to me. But tillage is also one. But these are the things they talk about. Have you ever seen a raindrop? Do you know how hard rain comes down? It can come down at 30 mile per hour. Looks like a mini explosion, like a nuclear uh, explosion almost. When that water hits that soil, that soil can go up. Let me see. What is it? Oh, three feet out, one foot up, and three feet out. I think that's right. I might have it backwards. I've got to remember that one. That's one I haven't talked this for a little while. When you get a little rusty here and you haven't talked, I'm pretty sure I know it's three and one. If I'm wrong, somebody tell me. But I think it's one foot up and three feet out is how far that, that uh, soil can move. So keeping that soil covered with something that's residue, it will absorb that impact and allow that water to infiltrate, okay? And that's important. That six to nine in inch elevation, again, 50% of that's pore space. That's three to four and a half inches of additional water storage. That's going to become important a little bit later. 
These are some of the dynamic properties in an uh, infiltration. Looks like I'm going to have to redo this one. Uh, I can see that little white coming through there. I thought that, I didn't even know that was on there. This uh, thing's picking it up. It's supposed to be hit. But anyways, where I plow, anytime I've got a plowed soil, I absorb about 0.26 inches, about a quarter inch. If I go to no-till with a bare surface, does it get better or worse? It gets worse. Why? Because what happens is on a bare soil on no-till, the soil is a little denser, and it moves just enough residue that it will bridge any of that pore space that I have in there, and it bridges it off. Okay? That's why you've got to have that residue there. If I go to 40% cover with no-till, I can get up to half, almost a half inch of water infiltration, and no-till with 80% cover, one acre inch per water of water per, uh, and that's a, that's a huge uh, increase. Uh, one acre inch, of, yeah, one one inch of water per hour is what I'm going to be able to get into that soil. Okay, so that residue really helps prevent the crusting. That's what's important. This was some research that was done. These plots have actually been destroyed now. It's kind of a sad story over at Coshocton. My understanding, it's now a uh, gravel pit. Uh, the, we had uh, research there for almost 50 years, but some of it was done at Coshocton. They did 40 years of no-till, okay? And they had no-till plots and conventional. No cover crops, just no-till, okay? And so what did they find? Where they had the conventional tilled fields, you can see the muddy water coming off of there, okay? 1,500 inches of water was recorded over a 40 year time period running off the bare fields. The fields that were no-till, how many inches of water? Notice the water's clear, that comes off. But how many inches, th this actually isn't from that site, but it shows what I wanted to, to show. Well, what, what, what did they find out? Seven inches in a, in a 40 year time period. The rest of it infiltrated the soil, okay? So that is huge with the runoff. And then you start adding cover crops, getting more biopores, macropores. You're going to spread that water out. It's going to be even better. Okay, so that's the impact of aggregate and the distillage. This is from uh, Hoytville area. This is flat ground up where I live. Same rain event, May 15th, three quarters of an inch uh, uh, of uh, rain. And these fields... Uh, are less than an eighth of a mile apart. It's all flat up there. It all looks the same. But you notice over here where they do rotational tillage with no-till soybeans and tilled corn, you got standing water with three quarters of an inch of rain. Over here, no-till uh, soybeans and strip-till corn, you don't have water standing. Okay? And that, that's really uh, important that we see that. This happens all over the country. Okay? This one is... Kansas, there it is, Kansas at the top, and these are all fields that are adjacent to each other or fairly close. No-till with the cover crop, over here, no water standing, and look at the water standing on these other fields. It, this is across the whole United States, okay? Here's another one. This is Brookings, uh, South Dakota, okay? No ponded water with the no-till, over here with the conventional, you're going to have standing water. I've seen this in uh, Putnam County. We got about a two, three inch rain. One of the guys, he just recently died of COVID here, but the no-till farmer had cereal rye and uh, got a two, three inch rain. He had no water standing on his, on his field. Next door, there was about a three acre pond and the farmers were sitting there looking. I mean, it was right to the row. And he's like, we're trying to figure out why you don't have any water on yours. He says, well, I'm doing no-till on a cover crop. He says, well, what good does that do? Well, we told him, but you know what? I went and looked at that site. There's an elevation difference there, guys. When roots go down, they push out, and they push the soil up, okay? Over time, you're going to build that back up. You're going to get an elevation difference. Part of the reason he had ponding water is because he had a lower elevation, but he also had less structure to his soil, okay? And... Yes, you got to have an outlet for that water, but even if you had an outlet for the water, the water's still going to hang there uh, because it's got to be able to get to the outlet. We have guys that are putting in tile on a regular basis, have, you know, 50-foot spacings that are now splitting them to 25. 
I had Bud Belcher. Bud, I'm sure, is gone by now because he was, 30 years ago, he was probably in his late 60s. So if he's around yet, good luck, Bud. But anyways, Bud said to me, uh, we were up at uh, Defiance County, Pauling Clay Soil, and he put his little penetrometer in there, and he had all these calculations. I said, uh, I said to him, Bud, how close do we have to have our tile? He said, well, Jim, based on my measurements, you need tile every six feet to make this soil work. I'm like, there ain't no way. But guess what, guys? I have guys that are now doing no-till on the cover crop, thinking about splitting their tile, and instead they put out the cover crop. What happens? Cover crops allow the water to get down, and then because you have the lateral roots, now you can move that water to, to, your, to your tile. They're safe money by not having to split their tile. Now, you still got to have an existing outlet, okay? And I don't know how far you can push this. I mean, I, we haven't done any scientific study on this, but as long as you've got outlets and you've got good soil structure, the water can move underneath the soil and get to those outlets, okay? So that is important. You might want to look at that. This is no cover. Look at how dirty that water is. This is a winter cover crop. And if you really look at this, if you get close, we have some pictures that was done in Fort Wayne and uh, where they had a winter cover crop and long-term no-till, the water coming off this field is crystal clear and the water in the ditch is about that much lower. Okay, less water runoff over the surface, less coming out of the tile. Now, eventually the water will come out and you'll get the same volume of water that will come out it just takes a longer period of time. It's got to move down through that soil, and gradually it'll get to your tile. You're probably thinking, well, isn't that going to hurt my yield? The answer is no, because the soil will drain from the top. Most of your roots are in that top six inches, and as that water slowly goes down, those roots can keep that plant alive as long as it's not totally saturated on the surface. They can keep that plant root alive. And then as it gets warmer or hotter in the summer, now you've got more of that water stored in that, in that soil profile. Eventually, that water will move out to the tile if, it, if there's excess there, but it allows you to have water when you need it longer in, in, in the summer. That's the advantage of no-till and the cover crop. Okay. Same thing. Uh, the big thing here isn't how much rain falls, it's what happens to it after it falls. Is how much can infiltrate into your soils and how much can be stored there. That's the key point that we're trying to get. This just shows you graphically what's going on. 1% organic matter can store one acre inch of water in a sandy soil, 1.9, almost two acre inches in a silt loam. In a silty clay loam, it's about one and a half, 1.4. As the organic matter levels go up, if we take five and divide it into 2.5, yes, the relationship goes down. We're going to have, for every one inch of organic matter, if I take 5 into 2.5, it's about 0.5. Over here, it's about 0.8. And over there at the far end, it's about 0.6. But again, this is per foot of soil. Look how important, look how many inches of water we can store if we get our organic matter levels up. Okay, and that's really important in the middle of a drought. Just remember this, how many nutrients are lost is related to the speed of water. The faster that water moves, the more it can hold. So it's exponential. It's 2 to the 64th power, or 2 to the 6th power, which is 64 times more nutrients lost. So if I go from 1 mile per hour to 2 mile per hour, I can hold 64 times more nutrients. If I go from 2 to 4, now compared to the 1, I'm at 128. Some of the water running down through our ditches could be going 8, 16, possibly as fast as 32 right in the middle of our rivers, that's 1,024 times more nutrients, okay? So everything's related to the speed of water. If you get that water to slow down, it'll drop its load. You'll keep the soil in place. You'll keep your nutrients in place, okay? So this just shows you graphically. I made some pictures of this. This is under a conventional tillage. This is where we get that flashiness. It goes up really quick, goes down really quick. Over here with this ecological farming, you'll notice the water's a little clear. It'll go up, but it'll stay at that level for several days. And I graphically, I can show you that. This is a, uh, the, the ecological farming. Just stretches the time period out. Whereas this is coming very quick, 
and very fast, so we're going to have a lot of nutrients that are being lost, okay? This is what I've been trying to tell you. This is where your nutrients, about 80% of your nutrients are extracted within that top six inches of the soil. I know there's a lot of research on going against what Ohio State is claiming. The problem is they're doing a, a research project about five miles from my house. It's really giving me heartburn. You're going to spend, that'll give you heartburn when you hear what they're going to do, okay? Uh, $17 million they're going to spend on 5,000 acres. Somebody do the math on that. Does that give you heartburn? It does me. What are they going to do? They want to use subsurface placement of, of phosphorus. They're going to get three big machines, and the main thing they want to do is put that subsurface. I said, that's going to work real good. Well, what's been happening through our falls? They've been dry or wet. Wet. What's our springs been like? Wet. Really wet, right? Okay, almost to the point where I think the months have changed. I think our new May is June. Okay, and our new fall is probably maybe closer to November instead of October. It just seems like we've changed a little bit. But are we going to have time to get all that fertilizer put in subsurface? I told them it's not going to work. They said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, everybody there, they have the highest phosphorus. they got two watersheds they're studying. The potato, what's the other one? The shallow, something, shallow run, I think. And got really high phosphorus levels going on. I said, what's the main form of tillage in these watersheds? Vertical tillage. I said, you're going to put the phosphorus on, and for one year, you're going to pat yourself on the back, and then what's going to happen? You're going to vertically till that soil, you're going to create a hard pan, and in the year two, even though you didn't put in a, uh, put any markers on it, so they won't know, that phosphorus is going to run off. It's either going to go through the surface and get off, or it's going to go right down to the top. The, the rotational no-till, guys, it's 50% is bad, but uh, the rotational no-till is hurting us. A lot of guys think, well, I'm doing no-till, you're only doing half ways. Okay, and a halfway job is just that, a halfway job. It's still not, not satisfactory. So if you really want to solve this, you're going to have to get to a no-till cover crop type of system to make that work. Put the nutrients here, build up your organic matter, and I have a bunch of research that was done uh, that I helped well, on at Ohio State that shows that will help. That will help take it, uh, keep that phosphorus in that profile. But it's not being done, okay? What about temperature? We will reduce the temperature on these soils. A lot of our conventional tilled soils, they get really hot and they get really cold, okay? Where we have no-till on a cover crop, they don't get as hot, but they also don't get as cold, and so that's a better uh, zone for our microbes to live in, okay? So that's what we're trying to do. This is water usage in a hot, dry summer. This came from Dr. Elwin Taylor out of Iowa. 75 degree soil temperature, you need one acre inch of water to make 200 bushel corn. If the soil temperature gets up to 85, you need two acre inches of water. If the soil temperature gets to 95, four acre inches of water. Every 10 degree increase in soil temperature, you double the amount of water that you need, okay? One inch rain, fully used, is equal to eight bushel of corn. What's the price of corn today? Roughly. Seven bucks. Okay, so that's worth 56 bucks to you if you can use one acre inch of water more effectively, okay? One acre inch of water gives you eight bushels of corn, about six bushels of wheat, and about three and a half bushels of soybeans, okay? We generally need 22, eight, two, 22 inches of water per year uh, during that growing season to get 200 bushel corn. Most years, we're going to get 22 inches. Problem is, some of it might come in five inch increments, some might come in seven to 11. Ask the guys in Fulton County, month of July last year, 11 inches of rain, okay? 11 inches, uh, I think that might have been in one, at one time that they got, I forget, but I know they got a tremendous amount of rain. Everything was flooded up there, okay? So we gotta use it fully. I use four dollars here because that's what I had. I haven't updated this slide, I apologize for that. Let's talk about compaction. These are the ruts, okay, that come with that heavy equipment. 
And what we're finding out is that compaction can reduce your yields up to 60%. This is Randall Reader's data. And Randall says it lasts nine years. I think he's off on that. I would say it lasts probably 50 to 60 years. There was a couple guys in Australia. I went to Australia in 2014. And one guy was talking about his dad. They use, they go down and uh, they stay in the same row all the time in their fields, okay? So they, they stay in it. And his dad decided, well, the, the cart's empty. I'm just going to turn around in the field. And he came back. Do you know that they could pick that up and use satellite? They could pick up where he turned around in the field for the next seven to eight years. They could still see where that was at. He, he reminds his dad every time, he says, drive all the way to the end, okay? <laughs> now, I know a lot of us, I've looked at fields, and if you've ever looked at them on satellite, have you ever seen where the grain carts go and how we always cut across our fields? Uh, if you can get to the point where you're doing controlled traffic with no till and a cover crop, I think it can pay you dividends, okay? In order to make that happen, what do you have to do? You got to get all your equipment to the same size. You know, if you're if you're doing 20 foot or 40 foot, you get your grain head, you get your planter, you try to get everything set up, and then you you try to keep that like a garden, right in between where the rows are. Your spray equipment, everything has to be set up to do that. This is what it showed: 80 percent of your compaction. This is from Randall Reader comes from wheel traffic occurs on the first pass. So if I till a field and I go across that field with any kind of wheel traffic, 80% of that compaction from that wheel traffic will occur the first time I go across it. Okay, generally there's enough moisture in the soil that it's going to come back. So stay off these wet soils. Now, on the flip side, if you really have a field that's totally flooded, can you compact it? There's no room for airspace. So I've actually seen guys that have gone across fields where they're standing water. They actually do less damage in that field. Probably don't believe that. They'll do less damage than, than where that soil is starting to dry out a little bit. Okay, That's when you do the most damage. So stay off them when they're wet. If you ever have to really go through it, why, if you do have to go through it when it's really wet, maybe you won't do as much damage. But this is what's going on. This is visually. We're pushing down, we're pushing that soil out, and we're pushing up. So notice we get this kind of a hump, and then it goes down, and we get another hump, and it goes out. That's what's happening, okay? So what happens if I were to diss that shut, and we get rid of a rut? Seems like we ran out of soil, doesn't it? There's always a dip. What's that dip? That's the air and the pore space. Now we forced all that soil together, Okay, and we've got this little bit of air there, that's what's causing the ruts, and that's what's causing our soils to shrink. Okay, 50% loss of void space, that's what we see in a compacted soil. Now look, notice what this radish is doing. This is a really big radish, and so that radish is doing the same thing. It's compacting the soil. It pushes down, pushes out, and it physically lifts it. Okay, but when we take a penetrometer to that, what are we going to see? Okay, it's adding pore space to that soil. So what your roots are doing, they're pushing down, they're pushing out, they're physically expanding it, but when that root decays, it turns into organic matter, and the microbes and the worms and that will move that around your clay particles, and they'll give that soil physical structure, uh, structural stability. Okay, and we'll see some slides on that here in just a minute. So what are we seeing wherever we have the radish? 40% decrease in compaction, okay? So that's huge. That's what we're trying to get to. These are those microaggregates, the very small soil particles, and these microaggregates are going to combine together to form macroaggregates. So what we're doing is we're just taking uh, these very small little microaggregates, adding some water, adding some plant residue, and we're going to form a macroaggregate. Inside this real little microaggregate, that's where we're getting those reducing conditions. There's no oxygen in there. That's where your, your micronutrients are plant available. Okay? And what happens is we form this big microaggregate, and they're breaking down, reforming, breaking down, reforming. When they break down, they're going to release those micronutrients to it. Have you ever thought about this? How is it possible? 
You ever have a field that just totally floods? You got a river bottom? How is it possible that you get aerobic bacteria back into that, into that plant or into that soil? You ever thought about that? Well, this is how it happens. You've got this macro aggregate that's kind of sealed this off, and there's air spaces in there. That's where your aerobic, your beneficial microbes. And then you also got these aerobic packages, which that's not going to hurt in the flooded field, but they're going to live inside there. And so now they both can coexist. Okay? And with this macro aggregate, again, the roots can go right by it. You've got good air and water movement. Now you're going to get good nutrition on that plant. All right? So these are the mycorrhizae. They're very small, one-tenth the size of a hair. They move through there. They can explore that soil quite well, and they're bringing back all your nutrients to you. Again, that's that glomulin. We talked about that. Building soil, it's a little bit like building a house. Okay? So here's all our components. We have the architect, which is Mother Nature. Carpenters are the plants. We have our foundation, which is our sand, silt, and clay. The frame for the house are your roots. The humus and the phosphorus are like your nails and your lag screw. And I'll show you how we're going to build this house in a little bit. Braces, nitrogen, and sulfur. Let me ask you, if you want to make iron strong, what do you do? Add a little sulfur to it, right? You also add nitrogen. Nitrogen. You know what they did in World War II? Uh, what did they put on the uh, airstrips? And hydrous. Why? Uh, Made it hard. Why? Because it has a triple bond. Sulfur has a triple bond, and it really makes things. If you think about carbon, carbon's like spaghetti. Okay, it's real. I mean, wet spaghetti. Okay, not. And it's real flexible. You add a triple bond, you strengthen it. 